Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about finally violence and abuse. At first, this might seem like a dark subject, and whenever I have to talk about family violence and abuse, you know, it really gets to my heart. Anytime in sociology when we're studying society, groups of people, and we have to address these subjects, you know, it's often really tough. And a lot of sociology, you know, is focused on some of the negative things in society, including family abuse. However, as in, on a brighter side, you know, after reading this chapter, the chapter ends with the fact that it is significantly de declining, that violence in general is declining, that negative attitudes and sexism and racism and all these other factors are declining in society. So there is a lot of hope. But again, at the end of this chapter, when we talk about the fact that family violence is declining, that is just an uplifting fact, you know, and I have to ask why. But again, that's where sociology comes in. Why is that rate declining? What are we doing right? What is getting better? And how is it getting better? Okay, so again, it's very important to study family violence just to advocate for it and spread awareness. And it could be that people are more aware that family violence exists, that there's more options for conflict resolutions in modern times, that, you know, our interchanging family dynamics enable us to leave situations that are negative, that cause conflict, that are really stress imposing. So, you know, some hope in this chapter is that, you know, family violence is decreasing. But regardless, violence and abuse exists in society and it exists within institutions of society, including the family. So again, we have to have this uncomfortable conversation. We have to address family violence, if only to get the information out there so that we can reduce the frequencies of family violence and also address which groups need help and how we can help them, okay? Uh, victimization is common in the U.S. in families and institutions. So again, our ability to address it, talk about it, publicly acknowledge it, gives us a chance to be able to reduce the traumatic events of violence and abuse, okay? So again, what are the causes and consequences? Again, we have to take a biopsychosocial approach to all things, even though we're in a sociology class. In that, you know, think about human nature from an evolutionary psychological standpoint. Aggression and violence is built into our genetics. We are also capable of causing harm upon each other. Therefore, from a functionalist perspective, for example, why do we need forms of social control? Why do we need the socialization process? And again, humans probably need our behavior structured so that we can get along with other people. And again, things that cause conflict in society, you know, we need to be able to address that. And we need to socialize people to reduce that conflict so we can get along better in the end. Um, we have legal policies, again, forms of social control that support these ideologies against violence, against rape, against abuse. So again, it's built into our society to structure people's behavior, to reduce our biological impulses. But again, how much of violence and abuse is cognitive, whether it's warfare or genocide or a domestic, you know, spout with your spouse? You know, think about the heated moment and then, you know... If you look at things like murder rates and studying criminology, a lot of it, 42% of it, have, of like murders, for example, occur over an argument. So again, an argument, you know, turns into a heated discussion and all of a sudden these violent impulses of humanity come to come out. And so the book concludes with this idea that we're becoming more aware of that. And as we formalize and modernize as a society and our ideologies become less violent, then we will begin to structure some of our biological impulses. And again, the sociological perspective is how culture and socialization, institutions such as the government and the family structure our behavior and socialize us and teach us the cultural norms. And so again, if we teach cultural norms that are anti-violence, you can see some change. And I like to point at things like frat culture, for example, because depending upon the culture that you exist in, in some cultures, things are more acceptable in other cultures, and they can be associated with things like sexual violence, okay? So the book points out that, again, family violence is associated with the state, meaning government politics, and the market, meaning economics. And it talks about, you know, factors associated with family violence, such as low educational attainment, being in poverty, the existence of specific cultures. 
So again, it's a dark chapter, but we have to delve into it because this exists in society. And again, that's what we're studying. We're in sociology. We're studying society, groups of people, and the institutions that structure society, like the family, economics, government, politics, even the military in this chapter, because we'll talk about how military status is associated with an increase in violence, for example. So again, we're always pointing at some of these variables, and that's kind of the sociological perspective, looking through the lens of these variables of economics to account for family violence, looking through the lens of race to account for family violence. You know, this book is really interesting because it'll say things like, yes, family violence goes up for African Americans compared to non-African Americans, but why? Is it because of race? Is it because of biology? Or is it actually because of poverty, because of economics? Because what happens when you subjugate an entire race of people into the lower classes in a capitalist system? And then how is that associated with the imposition of stress, which is then associated with the imposition of family violence, for example? So again, we're always thinking about these multi-dynamic variables from a biopsychosocial perspective to account for the existence of violence in families, <clears throat> why it happens, and then the consequences and resulting social controls that are put into place to help reduce some of these factors. So again, what is family violence? The book talks about intimate partner violence, violence against children, elderly abuse, and again, family violence and abuse are just umbrella terms for you know, the larger interplay of all the different forms of conflict that you often find in families, okay? And again, how conflict is defined and socially constructed and what is defined as problematic conflict compared to normal conflict, again, is culturally constructed. But again, what is the difference between verbal abuse and physical abuse and things along those lines? You know, it can be a little bit ambiguous. So we need to clearly define what the boundary lines are and what becomes violence. So child abuse and neglect, one of the saddest things you'll ever study in sociology, of course. Um, but again, this is important for all people in all fields because if you're a nurse, for example, you know, are you seeing child and abuse and neglect? Of course you are. And nurses see that on a daily basis, people coming in for problems and stuff like that. So when you go to teach things like cultural competency, you know, studying child abuse and neglect is relevant for teachers and nurses and all kinds of fields, lawyers, you know, and it, and it penetrates all institutions, not just the family. Okay. So the book opens up talking about the patterns of child abuse and neglect. It exists most commonly by a parent or a caregiver uh, engaging in maltreatment. Um, from the CDC reports, one out of seven children are victims of physical abuse and neglect. One out of three girls and one out of 13 boys are sexually abused. And again, 91% of those people that are abused are by someone they know. And so again, that's the association between the family and child abuse and neglect and that it most likely occurs within the family and by somebody that the people know, okay? The family as an institution, think about it from a functionalist perspective again, what's the purpose of the family? And again, it's supposed to provide safety, but it's within the institution of the family that you know child abuse and neglect most commonly occur. What really got me on this subject is that when you look at child abuse and neglect by age, and you ask which age is most likely to be a victim of child abuse and neglect, you find that babies aged zero to one are two times more likely than any other age, zero to one, to be abused. And then you have to ask why. And again, is that the stress imposed upon parents? Is, you know, what's going on with that? Babies can't talk, they can't advocate for themselves. And so again, albeit that's an incredibly sad aspect, but that's a group we need to help. If it's the baby zero to one that are most commonly abused, then how can we help them? What as we as a society can do <clears throat> for those parents to reduce the stress, give them some kind of support? What can we do for those parents, for example, to reduce them you know, engaging in child abuse and neglect for their children? Okay, uh, remember that many cases are not reported and families will commonly, because of shame and guilt and all kinds of other reasons, hide this kind of thing under the rug, but still the numbers are substantial to the extent that this affects everybody, okay? Uh, the book states that child abuse is most likely to occur if parents have mental health problems or were abused themselves, uh, in households where violence is occurring between adults, especially with adults with criminal records, um, poor families with low education, uh, single parent households, 
and families with weak so social support networks from their extended family. And so you have to think, you know, how can we help people? That means that parents, you know, with mental health problems, like what can we as a society do to support them? Can we help them with counseling? Can we help them with health insurance so they can see proper mental health care? You know, how can we reduce violence amongst adults and conflicts within the house? What can we do about people with criminal records being exposed to violence in the institutions, being exposed to violence and poverty that led to crime themselves? Uh, how can we help low income and low educational attainment families and single parent families? You know, these are all groups that we can help. And if we help these groups of people, we can reduce child abuse and neglect, along with changing our ideologies of whether or not that's acceptable. And again, think about things like spanking, you know, is spanking even acceptable in modern times? And so those are really good questions that we have to be asking. And then even though more so, you know, how do we structure children without the use of corporal punishment? It's just a whole great developmental psychological question that we could be asking, you know, how do we raise children without ever having to hit them? You know, there are many ways to do that, okay? Um, but again, child abuse and neglect causes in incredible amount of trauma on children. It's unavoidable. It's also associated with, you know, later in life, poverty and isolation, illness, violence, and criminality too. So <clears throat> again, child abuse and neglect is a major social problem that we have to address. Uh, elder abuse also is a social problem that must be addressed because this is something that didn't even commonly come into light until more recently. And this be could because you have an older cohort living and living longer than ever before. So the increase in elder abuse, you know, over the last couple of, you know, over the last century really as health and technology has increased to the extent that people are living longer is becoming something that we're much more commonly studying, especially in the areas of gerontology, okay? But again, Elder abuse often takes place in these intimate settings or caring relationships, mostly in families, okay? And so again, it's the stress imposed upon families, for example. So how can we help the elderly get the care that we need so that families are not stressed out by this? Because that's just, you don't want to admit it because you want to be there, right? But at the same time, this does cause stress, and that stress is then associated with elderly abuse, okay? And so 14% of elderly people have reported when surveyed experiencing elder abuse of some kind. Uh, intimate partner violence. It's also commonly been known as domestic violence, but people are moving from domestic violence, and they're legally using the term now of intimate partner violence, but the book kind of goes back and forth on the use of the words. Um, intimate partner violence occurs between those involved in sexual or romantic relationships, okay? The book statistics are ridiculously high. They say that 44% of women and 25% of men experience sexual violence in some form by their intimate partner. And then it states that women are seven times more likely than men to be victims of intimate partner violence. Albeit, again, just like child abuse stats, much of this is not reported. But when you look at the murders for women, and you, you see that 42% of women that are murdered are murdered by their intimate partner. <clears throat> so again, this is a major concern. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some theories of why this happens. But again, we lived in a patriarchal society for a long time that consisted of male domination and male control. Um, compounded with all the other biological and psychological factors associated with violence. Again, just think about fights that break out between couples and what happens and how do people deal with conflict resolutions and how do people deal with not getting what they want, for example. And again, this is all part of a much larger discussion. You know, right now we're just kind of hitting the surface of the institutional, the demographic factors of it, you know, and the just the existence of it in general but if you really delve into the psychology of violence and what's actually happening and what's going through people's minds while this is happening it's a very deep subject to really account for it that's why i keep stressing the biopsychosocial process and that we have these biological impulses to be violent however our cognitions have the power you know to control or at least manage our biological impulses and the society that we live in structures our behavior structures our ideology structures the way we think in general our attitudes toward the use of violence teaching us skills and coping mechanisms to engage in proper conflict resolution so again it, it's a big subject but again that biopsychosocial approach is a really great approach to being able to study family violence 
Um, the context of intimate partner violence, the situational couple violence. Again, that's what I'm talking about. Just think about those situations in which things get heated. I've taken my classes a lot of times to, you know, intimate partner violence week, like at some of the community colleges and things that I've taught at and other universities. And, uh, you know, they have to go see a, a movie. And the movie starts out with a couple, everybody's happy, but then the one, you know, partner starts getting a little bit more controlling, starts controlling their friends. Before you know it, that person's not even seeing their friends anymore and their boyfriend is completely controlling them. And then by the end of the video, the girl is, you know, murdered by her boyfriend. And all the signs are there of intimate partner violence and overarching control. And, you know, but that's a tough week, but we, you know, we talk about that and we try to spread awareness of it. And that's why I'm in my classes, watch those videos and I take them down to the auditorium and it was a school sponsored thing, you know, and by the end of that video, you're a little bit broken. But again, you get broken because the reality of this existing. Okay. But again, that's why it's important that we spread awareness. That's why it's important that we talk about it because what do couples do in these situations? For example, you know, we need that good conflict resolution, those good skills, you know, to be able to like talk about your feelings and how was your day and then not be screaming and yelling to the extent that you're tearing down the house. Okay. Um, so the book also talks about coercive controlling violence and then who is at risk? Women, especially younger women, uh, families with economic hardship, drug and alcohol abuse, cohabitating relationships, uh, after leaving abusers, slightly higher for African Americans and Native Americans, again, but this is due to poverty, not because of someone's race. So regarding sexual violence, the book defines rape as penetration. Sexual assault includes rape, but also non-penetrative assault, such as groping, uh, incest, which is illegal. It opens up the idea of the Me Too movement, again, spreading awareness about the discrimination and sexual violence experienced by women in the workplace. Um, and in modern times, you have this idea of the importance of consent. And a little bit, this can be ambiguous because when do you have to get consent? But again, my kids, you know, I raise them that every time you go to kiss anyone, make sure you ask them if it's okay, because I don't know what else to do in modern times. You know, that's kind of the best really communicative approach to really, you know, covering that kind of an area. But the book talks about all kinds of areas. Like if you're in a couple relationship and you live together, you know, do you have to ask consent? And if you're husband and wife, do you have to ask consent? And if you look at, you know, from a legal standpoint, historically, all the way through the 1970s, there weren't any laws against really a husband raping his wife. And then all of a sudden we had this sudden change in attitude, think whatever for that, you know, but again, so that now it's illegal even for a husband to rape a wife without consent, okay? So, and that's good. We are, again, tearing down these patriarchal structures that enable male domination and set up a system of sexism and inequality that resulted in the victimization of females. And so, again, to live in a sad reality that our society is often racist and sexist and ethnocentric and heterosexist and We've engaged in major atrocities, you know, from war to genocide to, you know, the complete subjugation of females for hundreds of years. You know, it's good that these walls are being taken down, but these walls are being taken down through education, through advocacy, through changing hearts and minds. OK, um, sexual violence most likely occurs again by an intimate partner or an acquaintance. And so this idea of stranger violence, yes, but that only accounts for 10% of all sexual violence. The ones you have to really be afraid of and the ones we really need to have concern with are those people that are the closest to us, those people that we know. Uh, sexual violence is associated with alcohol and drugs. And again, there is that legal ambiguity, ambiguity in relationships regarding consent that the book continuously addresses because, again, that's the cornerstone of so much of this. When it goes to proving cases and getting the police involved and prosecution, and again, that's the historical just debate over it. You know, it's very hard to prove. So, so many rapes get, un, you know, the, the, they don't even test the rape kits half the time because the institution is so overwashed. Um, there's a lot of really dark stories about that. If you guys delve into the news and the backup of the rape cases in Detroit and things like that, like they were just sitting on thousands of rape cases that were never even tested. So again, it's an entire bureaucracy involved in the legal 
sanctioning of sexual violence and then how effective is the legal system at stopping sexual violence and essentially it's not the most effective way to really stop sexual violence is within families it's within you know those close intimate relationships and the people that you know and it's conflict resolution and being able to find safe haven and things along those lines Okay, so again, the laws have historically been biased toward males, but they are changing. Again, husbands can no longer legally rape their wives, but how effective is the criminal justice system and other forms of social control like the police? How effective are they at stopping, you know, this nature of sexual violence against females and males? Okay, and again, families often hide it due to guilt and shame. And so when you have that violence within families, people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to get it out on the surface. But then it just continues for decades and decades. And that's what the book talks about when, you know, you're talking about the long term effects of sexual abuse. And that is not always just like a, an exclusive incident that is something that often goes on for many years, which is just an incredibly dark, sad reality about people and society in general. But again, that's why we have to talk about it so we can reduce it regarding LGBTQ IA plus relationships uh, and violence, again, it's the same thing for everybody. It doesn't matter your sexual orientation. We all share the same risks. We all share the same biology and genetic potentials and, you know, structures of the brain. What really matters is the way we're raised and the socialization process and cultural ideologies toward people and coping mechanisms and skills to, you know, really engage in conflict resolution <laughs> to reduce this. Okay, and then again, consent. Um, but the problem is with African Americans, with people that identify with gay, the stigmatization attached to races and sexual orientations is then associated with a lack of reporting, for example, because people that are gay, for example, or black might, you know, mistrust the police for various reasons. And so again, we have to take that stigmatization effect when it comes to reporting of sexual abuse. But again, sexual abuse occurs across the board um, in all cultures. It's a universal fact of humanity. It's built into the genes. And so the only way to really you know, stop that is through that socialization process, through creating and constructing a society that does not allow sexual violence and is anti-sexual violence and believes in protecting people and taking care of the children and no abuse, just happiness and safety and security and consent and that is peace. So the trends, again, a very positive note, violence is declining in general overall, okay? Sexual violence has dropped 50% since the 90s and another 40% since. Violence in the families has dropped 80%. This is an amazing concept. That's why I wrote, this is amazing. What the question mark? Because seriously, how did that happen? Now, violence is down across the board. Uh, crime is down across the board. Drug use is down across the board. Actual sexual activity is down across the board. So there's a lot of changes going on in society and you have to ask what's going on. Are people just being more coming more educated? You know, is it just that, you know, people are better in general? Is this that our biological impulses are toned down because we're all on our phones all the time? I have no idea. But again, violence in families, that means physical and sexual abuse has dropped 80%, which is an amazing statistic. Albeit much of that's not reported, of course, so we have to account for that. But again, why? And the book says increases in shelters and hotlines. So people have access to, you know, getting help along with legal services. Again, women can get protection in modern times. Um, women's increased economic independence and social acceptance of divorce and that they can leave, you know, threatening hostile environments. Uh, the overall recognition of, uh, recognition of harm caused by violence across society. You know, again, we as a society are recognizing how much trauma this is in causing, and maybe we're just becoming better people. Uh, decline in marriage rates. So again, less people are exposed to violent partners. These are just some of the trends. But again, think about some of the cognitive trends and the way people are being raised and the socialization process and cultural norms and expectations and standards. And maybe the police are just really doing a great job. Maybe the criminal justice system is doing a great job. It is all of these factors. Again, to answer why sexual and physical abuse are going down, 
why crime is going down, why drug use is going down. There's so many variables to account for, but that's the beauty of sociology is that we have to take that biopsychosocial process and really just address it to figure out what's going on in society. But again, the consequences of family violence, it often... These situations occur over the long term. The actions occur for many years often, and so do the consequences across the lifespan. Um, People experience shame and guilt, stigmatization, overall fear, fear in future relationships, lack of trust, physical and psychological trauma, um, behavioral problems, especially with children, impaired academic performance for children. And again, you have to ask why. What's the effect of abuse on the psychology of a child that's causing behavioral problems and academic performance issues. And again, it's very complex. Uh, Weight loss, depression, anxiety, even postpartum depression. So there was an association between those who were previously abused and then when they get pregnant, an increase in the likelihood of postpartum depression. And then again, engaging in risky sexual behavior. So again, physical and sexual abuse has incredible effects on people from the brain to the body. And again, you have to think because look, people that experience depression, that also affects their genes, you know, and it's also associated with the reduction in the immune system, an increase in cancer rates and things along those lines. So trauma can affect the brain, slow down the brain, depress a person and then depress their body. And so again, it's a biopsychosocial process because a social context incident is causing stress upon the brain and people's cognitions, which is influencing anxiety and guilt and shame and stigmatization and fear and depression. And that then is epigenetically affecting their body and the way their body functions. And so I know we're in a sociology class, but again, that's so that's social sciences. You have to account for all of these factors from a biopsychosocial process to really understand the consequences of family violence. From a feminist perspective, again, we live in a capitalist society. That means there is inequality between social classes. And depending upon the location you exist in within a social class, that's associated with your overall life chances. Okay, your access to health and, you know, and good food and a car and a house and some money, which all equates to less stress in the end. And then we also live in a society of patriarchy. And so intersectionally, depending on the social class you live in and your sex, you know, it's a society that was historically dominated by those in power, meaning those in power in the class system, those in power, meaning males, those in power, meaning European descendants in the United States, those in power, meaning heterosexuals. Okay, so from a feminist perspective, you have to think about all these interactional factors that are associated with dominance in society. And so women historically were subjugated into the lower classes. And women historically were subjugated by males. And non-whites were historically subjugated. And people that were non-heterosexual were historically segregated. Okay, And so all these factors are associated with things like poverty and crime and increases in sex and abuse and uh, child abuse and all these different factors. Okay. So again, from a feminist perspective, feminism simply is a theory of equity. It strives for equity between all these different groups, meaning not necessarily equality, okay, but again, equal access, the opportunity to participate in society. That's feminism, okay? But you can see the association between male domination of society and and social institutions and sexual abuse, not just within women. The book also talks about religious factors. You know, historically, the church was dominated by males and so males were also engaging in sexual abuse of boys 80 percent of boys that were raped by people in the church 80 or 80 percent of people that were raped by people in the church were boys okay so again you have this blend of all these intersections just to account for different areas of physical and sexual abuse okay Traditional gender roles, meaning that males are providers and female homemakers, that mentality is also associated with an increase in sexual and physical abuse in states in America and countries. Okay, and the book talks about that, that, you know, they did surveys and, uh, of different states in America, and the states that are more traditional tend to have higher rates of this. Okay, abuse is more likely in lower income families. Again, that's the association with social class. Abusers are more likely male. That's the association with patriarchy. Um, And then again, women in the military was another facet that the book talks about. Again, the military being a male-dominated society. Um, 
institution and that women in the military have higher rates of sexual abuse than women not in the military. And the military, again, just like families, often swept us under the rug. But because of the media and spreading awareness, the military is no longer able to just deny the existence of sexual violence against women in the military. And now it has become part of the forefront. And hopefully now that it's the forefront, you will see a reduction in women in the military experiencing violence. Uh, to conclude, the book talks about interventions. Again, RASPID assessment, being able to train um, fr frontline workers, to be able to engage in RASPID assessment, to be able to take down the information that needs to be taken. But again, as we talked about earlier, how efficient are they at even testing the rape kits? So we still have a lot of problems within the institution that need develop, especially the prosecution of cases. Civil protection orders are have been shown to have a positive impact um, on reducing the amount of physical and sexual violence, court order treatment through counseling, domestic violence court, uh, services for domestic violence such as education, counseling, and support groups. Will we see a less violent future? Again, we've had a history of wars, genocide, and family violence, but maybe it will get better. Hopefully through restraining our impulses, economic affluence, government intervention, and conflict resolution, we will see a reduction in physical and sexual violence.